We live in a culture where people tend to be careless about what they say. Saying things that are not true, saying things that are divisive, saying things with the intention of hurting other people's feelings, or just opening their mouths and saying whatever comes out, all of which are forms of wrong speech. And when people are careless in what they say, we tend to get careless in how we listen. Which is a habit we have to overcome. Because when we approach the Buddhist teachings, he said at the beginning of every talk, listen and pay careful attention. Because if you want to know the Dhamma, and if you want to know its meaning, it's atta. You have to first be sure that you've listened well. This is a theme that Ajahn Fuang liked to repeat. Those who listen well gain discernment. Because when you listen well, you're actively engaging your mind. The Buddha himself said when you listen, try to focus your attention so that your mind is one with a topic that's being discussed. In other words, it's gathered in oneness around it. And you apply appropriate attention. You think about how does this apply to the problem of suffering and the end of suffering. And what is it telling me to do? And then you have to ask yourself, how do I check? if it's genuine Dhamma or not. That's another aspect of our culture. The idea that there is a true Dhamma seems to have died. The Buddha himself said the true Dhamma would disappear when counterfeit Dhamma came. In other words, there still would be true Dhamma around, but you wouldn't know for sure which was which. You couldn't be confident listening to the Dhamma that it was the genuine article. And the Buddha himself said the way to, to know is to test it, because he lived in a time when there was true Dharma, but there was a lot of opportunities for misreporting. You heard a report about what the Buddha said. He said, one, is it consistent with what you've already heard of what the Buddha said? And two, when you put it into practice, what results do you get? When he talked to the Kalamas. Because basically, if you take a teaching and put it into practice, does it lead to what's skillful? Does it lead to harm? Or does it lead to harmlessness? That's the basic teaching. And then he went into more detail with his stepmother. After her ordination, she came and asked him, teach me the Dharma in brief so I can take it into practice. And so he taught her principles for telling what was genuine dharma what was not. So you listen and try to understand the meaning, and then you put it to the test. Because that relates to the two meanings of the word atta in Pali, or meaning. One is the meaning in terms of words. When you say something that's not clear, how would you rephrase it so that it would be clear? Or how would you rephrase it so you can actually put it into practice? Translating words into words. That's one way of getting at the atta of a phrase, of a piece of dharma. The other meaning of atta, though, is that you actually experience the goal to which this is all aimed. Now that's another kind of atta entirely. This relates to the two meanings of the word truth in Pali. One is a true statement, and the other is the actual truth of a situation. You can say things about a situation that are true, as when the Buddha said, to speak the truth. But then there are actual situations, actual qualities in the mind 
that are truly there, the fact that they're truly there, your experience of them being truly there, that's another kind of truth. For instance, with the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha said to comprehend the first truth, to abandon the second, to realize the third, and to develop the fourth. They're not abandoning words about suffering or the cause of suffering. You're not developing words about the path to the end of suffering. You're abandoning the reality of the cause. You're developing the reality of the path. And that's what we're aiming at as we think about the atta of the Dhamma. But to get there, first you have to listen carefully, because you can misunderstand the words, and that will skew your practice. And when I was first reading John Lee's instructions on breath meditation, there's a passage where he says to make the breath syllable, in other words, bhutto, make the syllable equal to the length of the breath, taukan in Thai. But I missed it. I misread it. I read taunan and thought it meant that you use the breath syllable only with the in-breath and not with the out. Now, that wasn't too serious. I was still able to get the mind to settle down. But then I went back and read it afterwards, and I realized, oh, I made a mistake. It made me realize I, I could have made more serious mistakes. So I listened more carefully, read more carefully, thought more carefully about what the implications would be. When John Fung had me translated John Lee, even more so. I had to think very carefully about what each sentence meant. I got the basic meaning down. But when you're translating, you have to go beyond just the basic meaning. You have to get very precise. And in doing that, opened up a lot in my understanding of John Lee's teachings. As you listen to the Dhamma, as you read the Dhamma, listen carefully, read carefully because you're going to have to practice carefully. And what you do, say, and think will make a difference, because you're being charged with putting the true Dharma to the test. We live in a culture, as I said, where the idea of true Dharma has died, and all kinds of things are being taught. The Buddha said, within 500 years after he passed away, the true Dharma would disappear. It was about the same time as the teaching on the non-arising of Dharmas arose. The teachings that things seem to arise and pass away, but they don't really. Everything is just a oneness. Of course, if that were true, then the Four Noble Truths would not be true. But now we're told that we have to be open and accepting of all versions of the Dharma. And it's narrow-minded to think that one is right and another is wrong. But when different versions tell you to do different things, how, how can you accept both? You look for a teaching, one, that you actually can put into practice, a teaching that tells you that nothing arises and nothing passes away. It's not that you can test. Because all your actions to test it would be illusory, according to that teaching. So that fact right there rules that out. But there are other teachings of the Dharma that are not so easily ruled out. You're going to have to test them. This is where you have to think about the Buddha's teachings on the practice for stream entry. It starts by finding a person of integrity, and then listening to the true Dharma. And then you apply appropriate attention. This is it, asking how this applies to the problem of suffering, the cause of suffering, or the end of suffering. And then you practice the Dharma in line with the Dharma, as you've understood it. 
for the sake of dispassion, for the sake of being unfettered. Those were two of the tests that the Buddha gave to his stepmother. But you have to realize, if you're going to practice in line with the Dharma, you've got to listen carefully to what it says first. Think it through. Because your truthfulness is going to be a huge factor in testing the truth of the Dharma. You have to be true in listening, true in thinking, and true in putting it into the practice. That's how you arrive at the truth. So the lesson all the way through is be careful, take care. Try to get things right, right from the very beginning. And that will develop the habits that you're going to need to get things right all the way through. <laughs>